I feel like the self-destruct button was thoroughly smashed down, bump. Some days I used to think, I don't give a fuck, I'll just drink yourself into oblivion, I don't give a fuck if I don't wake up. See when I used to drink in fucking party? Had a hundred friends. See now I don't want to drink and I, do you want to go for a coffee? I've got five friends that I've seen. Yeah, it was a bad time for us, mate. It was a bad time and I feel like if I wasn't so determined, I wouldn't be sitting here now. That, yeah. And that's a fucking 100% a fact. You're either going to fight or flight. I was only wanted one fight. And as soon as the bell went, I just, whew, then I won. And that feeling I got of the win, I thought, nah, this is it. This is what I want to do. Today's guest, Aaron Chalmers, is known by the public for being in Geordie Shaw. He's got over 2 million followers on Instagram. And over the last coming years, he's concentrated on combat sports. He was an MMA fighter for Bellator, and now he's making his pro debut as a boxer. He boxes at Boxing Booth. I've personally shared a few rounds with him in sparring. I've ran with him, and I've got to know him as an individual. I believe this is going to be a very, very interesting podcast episode. Hope you enjoy it. Right, welcome back to my podcast, Stephen Siley Study. Got a wicked guest in front of me, Aaron. Chalmers, isn't it? That's Chalmers, how you put it. Chalmers, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't know how to pronounce it properly, but Chalmers, yeah. yeah? Chalmers, yeah. Perfect. Um, look, Aaron, there's so much I want to talk to you about. Um, I think you've had a really interesting life. I think you're only a couple of years below me. So I'm 36 years of age. You're 34? 34. 34, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I've been looking at, obviously, your life, doing a bit of research and thinking, do you know what? Um, you've had a really, really cool life so far and no doubt over the next 30 odd years and beyond, there's going to be some exciting things coming up, which I want to talk to you about. Yep. I want to jump straight into a topic which I typically wouldn't start with, but it led me to this conversation because I, I listened to a podcast this morning. So I listen to loads of podcasts to get myself pumped up, educated, motivated for the day. Yep. Being a sort of uh, partial boxer, I would call myself, I'm a keep fitter, but do a little bit of boxing. I listen to a lot of boxing podcasts and I, I listened to Eddie Hearn's one, No Passion, No Point. On there, they had Jake Paul. And love Jake Paul or not, he actually said something quite profound and quite, quite real. And this is what he said. He said, the old boxing promoters, they're a little bit like taxis. And I've come in like Uber app, like the Uber app, and I'm here to disrupt the industry. And he said that when you look at previous boxers, they would have to build up their profile by fighting going through the ranks and then building their profile up and only then can they get to british european and then world levels and they, they become a household name now though you've got tv stars you've got youtubers you've got social media icons that are building their profile first and slotting straight into the top and that's where he said to come in and i never thought about it like that i thought that's actually a really really kind of smart breakdown of what's happened to his sort of career and now I'm talking to you someone's got 2.3 million followers on on Instagram I'm thinking you've kind of got the same opportunity there so yeah I just thought I'll mention that to you so he uses that kind of phrase so the way I use it is you're a businessman right you're a businessman and you're, you've got two joiners on site right so I'm on the I'm on a cord and you've got another boxer on a cord right both do exactly the same job I'm not fighting for a world title he's not fighting for a world title but someone needs to take a slot. One joiner on the site makes you 500 pound a week. The other joiner makes you 100 grand a week. You have to pick one. You're a businessman, who are you gonna pick? The one that's gonna make you the most amount of money. Exactly. So, fair enough, I might have skipped the queue. This this joiner that makes you 100 grand a week might only be three out of his apprentice. This one that makes you 500 quid a week might be 10 years in his But it's a business. Of course. And that's, that's, it. that's how I look at it because I'm not taking anyone's place if I'm not I'm not fighting for a belt. They have to fill a card up. And as a businessman, I sell three, four, five thousand tickets. That man sells a hundred. So unfortunately, in this day and age, that's what people go for. And I'm sure if I was a promoter or if I had a business or and someone was making me all this money, you'd be stupid not to because it's about money yeah. at the end of the day. I totally agree with it. The, the, the thing is, um, I know you've got like the old school fans or the fanatics say, well, no, these people should, shouldn't be classed as boxers and they should. It's like when Mayweather fought Conor McGregor, right? So many people saying Conor McGregor is an MMA fighter. He shouldn't be fighting Floyd Mayweather. At the end of the day, it's a business. At the end of the day, it's about selling tickets mm -hmm. and selling out an arena. It's about a profile and adding value. Look, taking nothing away from the thoroughbred raw, raw boxers or fighters, and I appreciate everything they do, and that is a really hard line to, to kind of go down and become a very successful person. 100%. But why not? Why not build up your profile in something else, become very successful at that, 
and then transfer your audience over into a sport it doesn't have to be boxing could be something else could be anything exactly could be anything why not but, and I think in today's age where you can scale your profile very very quickly um, why not if you've got a passion for fighting or boxing why not well exactly that, not even just that so th this is the way the world's going the world is evol like revolves around the Instagram and your profile so I probably wouldn't fight like because I'm fortunate enough to train full time because I earn money through Instagram and I earn money through TV. So I don't have to go and work as a as a scaffolder like I used to. I don't have to go and scaffold Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, eight hours a day and then try and train. So I'm, a, I'm in a very fortunate position, which then makes me, I can then excel more probably because I'm in the gym with the pros like Amy Conlins. I'm in there in the morning at nine o'clock for three hours. Then I'm back in the evening. Whereas people that have normal jobs, they have to work to train, which is, like you say, it's a hard sport, do you know what I mean? It's a hard sport to, to work, to train, to have a family, do you know what I mean? It's a hard trying to keep all them three things up, and that's why very few make it, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Very few people make it to the top. So, I know that I'm never going to be a world champion, and I can hold my hands up, but what I can do is I can have some exciting fights along the way. There's some names, like you say, there's other people from TV, there's YouTubers, there's, I still want to have some pro fights, I want to have pro fights, but I also want to have fights that are going to make sense and make me some money. Do you know what I mean? So, and I'm honest with that, and I always have been honest with that. I'm not coming in like Jake Paul saying, I'm going to come and fight Canelo, I'm going to do... That's that's him, that's his kind of person, but I'm just coming in to look back. So you see, in MMA, I fucked MMA up. I was given an opportunity on Bellator, and I didn't... I, I wasn't living like a fighter. I was filming Jory Shaw for six weeks. I would come out, I would do eight, six, eight week camp and I would fight. But then I would go missing for three months till the next fight was booked in. And so I never ever stayed in, never once did I, from one fight to another, stay in the gym. So like I say, I would go missing, I would go on the drink and just live the life I was living was partying, do you know what I mean? So I was trying to be, well, I wasn't even an MMA, I, I was trying to say I was an MMA fighter. <coughs> But I wasn't living like one. So for probably from the first fight to the last fight, I was never any better. I would always, four weeks to get the weight off, do a little bit of skill set. And I'm lucky that I didn't get me fucking head punched off. Do you know what I mean? Because it's a dangerous sport. Do you know what I mean? And I wasn't living like I should have been living. Whereas now, this for me is last chance saloon. And that's why for the last 18 months, everything I have has been put into the boxing because I know... If I don't do this right the first couple of fights, then it's over. So it has to be all or nothing. Yeah. There's loads of little um, points you just said there where I can go off and, and talk about them. But kind of to round off the whole social media thing. So myself, mm -hmm. I'm um, obviously doing doing the podcast. And yep. part of the reason why I'm doing it is I get to connect with good people like yourself. My goal is to inspire the younger demographic. So when I was at school, there was no podcast, there was no YouTube, yeah. there was no social media. No direction, and, and, was there? Exactly. And it, it was typically, if you're going to leave school, you either go into the army or go into like carpenter, Trade. Scaffolding. Yeah, scaffolder. I was a plumber yeah, for, yeah. for a few years. And I was not living my life. I was living the dreams of my mum and dad because my mum and dad convinced me to be a plumber because they said, you'll never go skinny. Uh -huh. And that was their, their, their sales pitch to me. So anyway interviewing people I want to inspire a young man young female and give them a bit of direction hopefully this yeah. is what it's going to do so going back to social media kind of following I want to scale up not for scaling up sake but I believe if I've got more people following me therefore I can reach more people and help them yeah, and do you know what I'm not afraid to say where some podcasts or some influencers maybe not say it I would like to make money from it at some of point. Of course. You know, when I see um, Joe, Rogan Joe Rogan getting a hundred million dollar Spotify contract and he's just been offered another hundred million for yeah. another, from, a, for, from another platform, I'm like, fucking well done. That is that is amazing, very inspiring. But that's that's where another thing, so you're saying well done, a lot of other people with podcasts have been saying, that, what, that fucking arsehole, this. The jealousy through the, which comes with social media is unbelievable. Like, you'll never be, no one, you'll never get jealousy from anyone that's doing better than you it's always people that think exactly. it should be me but then they're not doing that because they're not putting the work in yeah do you know what i mean so i'm glad you said well done there because like i say a lot of people get envious do you know what i mean of but of course we we all we all out there to make our lives easier and make our family's life better which is money yeah money doesn't money 
unfortunately, does make the world go round. Yeah. Because might, money might not make you happy, but I tell you what it is, it gives you a lot of time to fucking see what you want to do in life. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, you, it's the thing that's, that's that you can measure. So when you say this individual or that company is better than that company, well, how do you know? Well, you could probably know through their social media following and, and maybe where they're based around, around the world and how recognisable their brand is. That's yeah. the way of measuring it. But yeah. really and truly, look at company's house, how many fucking assets have they got um, and how much money they've got in the bank. That's how you know how successful they are. Exactly. And, and it's not a bad thing. I think people have a bad connotation towards money because they think it's the root of all evil and you can't be happy if you've got it money. It can be. It can be. It definitely. can be. But so any, anything can be the root of evil, alcohol, do you know what I mean? But in a nutshell, if if you're skint, if you're doing all, you don't know what to do with your life and you're skint, then you you start becoming depressed. Yeah. If you've got money and you don't know what to do with your life, then you've got time because you know you can pay your bills and you know right. Well, I've got a few months of money. I can pay my bills and then I can sort out what I want to do. Whereas if you're skint, you have to work in a job that you don't want to work in because you need to you need to make money. Definitely. That's where depression comes in. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. So what I was getting to, so I've got a very a average following of like less than 6,000 people on my social media, but I know it's going to get there because I've got a strategy it'll in go place. It'll go when this, when this goes out, it'll go. <laughs> when when, I, when, when I'm, I'm dedicated, I mean, ever since I started my podcast three and a half years ago, I always said I would release one episode a week and I've never failed. Yeah. Over my birthday, over New Year's, over Christmas, I've always done it. Even if I'm going away for two, three weeks on holiday, I put some in the bank, okay? So I know it's going to happen. If... 6,000 people turn up today, my following, okay, at this store, I'll be overwhelmed because there's fucking loads of people outside. You know, whether they're against me or for me, there's loads of people. Yeah. 2.3 million people, just to put that in perspective, yeah, yeah. that is, that is three, six, nine, twelve. that is about seven, eight times the population of Iceland that follow Crazy. you. So, so when, when, I, when I think about that following, I think that's amazing, but also huge responsibility. So what's your kind of, like, how did you train your mind to even accept that 2.3 million people are going to start following you, for good or bad? Well, even now, it's it's still like, so now I kind of just switch off. Like, it's a following, people are followers, obviously people are followers, so I know I'm doing something right, like, people, I've, got kind of, I've got fans, if, you want, if that's what you want to call them, and people are interested in my life and stuff like that. But at the height, height of majority show, it was like 2.6. Do you know what I mean? And it was like, because I was on TV and I was getting pissed and I never used to watch the episodes or anything, so I didn't know what was going on. So it was like, you kind of you kind of gauge if you had a good episode or a bad episode just by messages coming through. Messages. I've You wouldn't believe some of the things I've, like some of the things I've had come through on my Instagram is fucking scary. Like when my son was born, I've had messages saying, I hope your fucking son dies. I would love to kick your son's head in. Which is all well, you've got to take the rough with the smooth, I understand that. 2.3 million followers makes my money, but then you've also got people like this. But when you get messages from people like this, I watched a thing the other day called uh, Don't Fuck With Cats. It was about a bloke who was he, he was killing cats and he went on to be a, a, a murderer. I, I remember, I think I remember right? this guy. If you're typing that about a newborn baby, what what kind of, per- this is the scary, what kind of person is this? Behind this computer screen, behind this fake account, what person is saying they want to smash a newborn baby's head in. Do you know what I mean? Like, like it's disgusting. So, my anxiety at one point, I, when I got with my missus, I just broke down. I couldn't handle the pressure. I, I, I couldn't handle going out because it was like two, 2.6 million followers in a, like everywhere I went, which is good. Can I have a picture? Which is good. But, oh, I must be, I must be like, they want a picture. But it started getting the point where I was, I was getting abuse in like, I thought I didn't. Nah, I, don't, I can't. I can't pinpoint it. I don't think the alcohol was helping because I used to drink to just fucking get rid of the anxiety, and I would drink. But then the next day it would come back. So it was. <coughs> I start getting in a, in a routine of thinking. Well, the only thing that gets rid of the anxiety is alcohol. Mm. Not realizing the next day it was coming back fucking twice as bad. Mm. So I was kind of getting in a rut, and then I, I had to go to therapy for the anxiety over the social media. I sat down within five minutes. I just broke down. I just. I was like. I, because I was a scaffolder. I was a scaffolder for 10 years. I was on building sites. I was on the oil rigs. Then I was just f- fucking overnight, just threw into the limelight where everyone's got an opinion on you. Your tattoos are shit, this, that. Do you know what I mean? I can take all that. I'm, I'm, But like, 
when it's constant, constant. And then I sat down with a woman and she said, um, what gives you the most anxiety? If I, if I said, what gives you the most anxiety? And I said, Twitter. She said, right, delete Twitter. That day I deleted Twitter. That was fucking four years ago, three years ago. So now I don't, like, I can't even get the Twitter app on my phone. And you see, since I've done that day, the anxiety half straight away, because I wasn't looking. I could see 10 nice comments and then one bad one, but like even now, like the, the social media is good if you use it correctly. That's the best way to put it. But you are, you are in the firing line to, to get fucking abuse. Like I lost one of my fights. I lost one of my MMA fights. Got a message saying, uh, you may as well just kill yourself now. It's just like, <laughs> but if I like, I'm quite a strong minded person, do you know what I mean? And this, I can see why so many people from, from reality TV have committed suicide. When you think of some of the stuff that is getting said to them, attacking family members, attacking newborn babies, attacking my girlfriend, it's, it's fucking disgusting. And that's the downside of social media. But like I say, I use it to my advantage. I use it to pr promote myself. I put a picture on, I don't look at comments anymore. And I just, anytime I get like, you know, you get messages where you can request. I don't ever read, I just delete because I just didn't want to see it. Whether it's good, it might be nice, but I don't want to see it because the, the, most of the time it's people just ha having an opinion that I don't don't want to know. Yeah. So you kind of got to switch it off. But it took me years to realize that. There's a bit of a saying, I don't know where I saw it from, like a self-help personal development book, and it said that enough rain will wear the marble. So even if we are granite as, you know, emotionally in our mindset, if there's enough rain, enough comments to keep keep them flying at you, eventually it's going to wear you down. 100%. And I think switching off is a good thing. Going back to the interview, if you haven't listened to it uh, with uh, Jake Paul on Eddie, Eddie Hearn's podcast, it's actually quite good because Katie Taylor's obviously fighting Jake Paul's... Uh, Serrano, isn't it? That's it. And this is the point I'm going to get on. So Serrano has been multiple, multiple weight uh, world world champion yeah, sure. over, over, over seven weights, I think. And... Um, when Eddie Hearn asked her something like, oh, where's your phone? She said, I've never owned a mobile phone in my life. He said, what do you do for social media? And she said, I, I, don't, I don't have it on me. And I was like, oh my God, that is such a privileged position to yeah. be in. Now, I, I, in me saying that, I should be able to just say, right, fuck it, throw away my phone or throw away right. my social media. It's very, very difficult. And I'm making right. excuses because I'm, you know, I'm in the, the art game. you build yourself though. I, I'm in the art game. A lot Aye. of my deals come through social media, the internet, you know, um, I'm communicating with people all the time or I'm trying to scale up my podcast, either reaching to people, like new guests or just reaching people that want to listen to it. Yeah. Um, but when I heard it from her, I was like, wow, that is that that takes a special individual not to have a mobile phone in 2022. Well, I always said, I always say to me, to me missus, I said, once it's all said and done, once the the TV's done, the boxing's done, and the the money's dried up on Instagram, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna fucking sell the Instagram because it's two point two million followers. I go to a company, do you wanna buy this? And I'm gonna sell it. I'm gonna set up a little private one for me, me missus and me kids, and I'm just gonna add me friends because that's all that's all that really matters. Like, but at the moment, I I have to have social media, and it's it's a horrible thing to see. You have to have it. But I do because that's where my income comes from. Hmm. And I'm kind of stuck in that rut where, like yourself, you needed to promote. If you didn't promote yourself, like you say, you're in the art game, how else would they, how else would they know what's coming in and what's, what's not? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's kind of... But I, I feel sorry for the younger generation. You see, like, like young girls and young girls and boys, 16, 17, 18, and they've got in the, in the bio, uh, what's that fuck? Influencer or what's that other one? Um, there's a fucking word I hate. Not, but they have it in the handle. Public figure. Public figure. Public see, fucking figure. I see it all the time. And I'm like, what? What even is that? Like, because I don't <laughs> even know what that is. Like, am I a public figure? I don't know. But they, they've got public figure in the bio. They've got like 500 followers, and I'm thinking, they like some people. If people now, like, might like you see, you left school. I left school. A scaffolding. I well, I worked in a factory. Then I worked at Asda. Then I went scaffolding. And I would never think of leaving school and thinking, right, I'm going to be a public figure on Instagram and I'm going to make money because it's not realistic. It's not, it's not realistic. Some of them, some of them, these young people, 20, 18, 20, they get given clothes and taking pictures. How are you living though? Yeah. How are you living if you're not making a, 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 making a wage? And this is where I feel like the world's going to be fucked with social media because so many people don't want to work now. They want to be, 
They want instant uh, instant results, instant gra- right. gratification. Where like yeah. you say, you're 36, I'm 34. I fucking I scaffolded for 10 years. You worked your ass off plumbing. Yeah. It's not like people say to me, you've never worked a day in your life. And I'm thinking, fuck me. If you knew what I'd worked, you probably, you probably couldn't even do, do half the things I've done in scaffolding. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But they, they don't look at, they just look at Jolly Show and ah, you've never worked. Yeah. So I just don't even argue with it. But yeah. I, I know deep in my head, I think you've got no clue. Yeah. Like I grafted my also. I had, a, I had fucking four paper rounds from when I was 10 years old till I was 16. Yeah. So I could make money. And so I used to love motorbikes when I was a kid. My dad was like, right, you save your money for a motorbike, you can buy one. So I fucking got all these paper rounds and I was determined. I was a pure greedy little twat. Yeah. Didn't I just spend 50 pence a week on a mix-up and then that was it. I would save the rest to get a motorbike. Do you know what I mean? So, but yeah, I think that, back to social media, I just think it's, uh, I would hate to see the next 10 years. Like, like, I think unemployment and people chasing, like you've got people now wanting, I want to be a reality TV star. See when I went on Jordy's show, I didn't think of anything. I was on the oil rigs, I had a fucking cracking job and I got offered it and I thought, I'll go in there and I'll have fun and if it doesn't work, I'll go back to the oil rigs. Yeah. Whereas people now, they're getting a little taste on, on TV and it has to work for them because if it doesn't work, they've got nothing else. Yeah. So I, that's why I think it's a danger putting young girls on TV at 18, 19, 20 because they haven't got a trade or they haven't got nothing to fall back on so they get this taste of the highlight they get a quick bit of money like you, you love islands get quick 50, 60, 70 grand spot thingies over the year they've made two, three hundred grand but then once that next love island comes out they're forgotten about all them deals they got that first year goes to the new people Yeah, and that's when the, the depression comes in because they're like I'm not making any money I'm not doing this and they've been given that high life and then it's, it's kind of dragged away from them and it's a horrible situation to be in and it, it's like I say, I'm I'm quite strong minded, but it's it's fucking scary, and this is why I think there's been a loads of suicides with 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 uh, with TV. Yeah, I've um, so I think the guy who had the biggest following, the biggest person on my podcast, by you because you're you're now the the person with with, with the most is, uh, and also I just realised I think you're the only person. I'm trying to wrap my brain out of 185 episodes. You're the only person I've interviewed interview in who's actually been a MMA uh, fighter I've, oh, not, really? I've only ever uh, interviewed boxers, boxers. I'm trying to think of any obviously footballers rugby players yeah, yeah, etc yeah. but no MMA people which is the first as well oh that's good then so Jack Fincham uh, 1.9 million followers I think he's got and he also said exactly the same thing and when we concluded the conversation about social media and I've had this conversation with a lot of people with, yeah, yeah, with yeah. big following you know hundreds of thousands of followers is you got to use social media, not let social media use you. Mm-hmm. And he, what you just said there about you put as a young person onto TV, and there's a, an attraction to it. Of I mean, course. if someone said to me right now, look, I'm going to put you because I'm thinking about my podcast and I'm thinking about promoting Woodbury House and also the artists that we represent. Someone said to me, I'm going to put you on a new version of Georgie Shaw or, or Tawi. Yeah, I would half consider it because I feel well if I could build myself up in the right way that would lead on to other opportunities, of course. financial gains, added value to moldings, etc. But there is a downside to it, which is if you don't prepare yourself, then you're going to have all of this success. And then when it does come to an end or you want to take a different route, if you don't really have a plan, then that's when the drink, the drugs, the, the self-abuse, the, 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 the depression, anxiety, the fear Aye. steps in. And Jack Fincham even said in my podcast, he said like, about a year or so before that, he said he was considering taking his own life because right. he had this money, all these endorsements, said a few wrong things on social media, became depressed, became a little bit sort of out of shape. And before he knew it, people were slinging him loads of abuse on social media. Yeah. that it, it's That's what's bad, the, the abuse. But like, <clears throat> you know what I don't get is people waking up, right? Like, so there must be some sad people, sad, sad people that must have such sad lives to want to go on a social media and abuse a, a young a young girl or a young lad or like someone, someone's kid. Like, you must, you, you must be, you must be sad. Like, you must have a sad life. You must have nothing else in your life to, to try and bring others down because to me, why? Why do you want to, like, people get, like, some of them get a kick, but they always do it on fake accounts. Yeah. They're, not, they're not man enough to do it on their own account. They'll do it on a fake because that's what well, the, sh- the shitty horses. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They haven't got the balls. And most of the time, I, I guarantee, it's probably some fucker that you know. It's probably someone that you know that's that's giving you the abuse. Yeah. Because the envy, the, the, do you know, is it, it's a, 
I can't wait for the box and everything to be over because I'm, my social media will be gone. Yeah. That's it. And I can live my life and I can, I can take my kids on holiday and without people saying, uh, you should have sun cream on. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I had put a picture of my newborn, my newborn baby, and I was kissing him. He's fucking my son. I made him. He's mine. Kissing him. You shouldn't be kissing the baby on the lips. And I thought, oh, fuck off, man. Yeah. Fuck off, man. Do you know what I mean? Jesus Christ. You can't do right for doing wrong. <laughs> you can't. I parked, I, I, you know, I, I went through a stage, right, when I was making loads of money and I started just posting stuff to annoy everyone. And I thought, because I was getting that much abuse, I thought, you're going to give us abuse, I'm going to start doing it. So I bought a Range Rover, then I bought an Audi R8, then I put them side by side, and I was parking them in Disabled Bay, just to annoy people. And I thought, well, I'm getting abused anyway, so I might as well give you a reason to abuse. Go then, with it, yeah, But go then with I look it. back and I think, I hate them, <laughs> what I've done, because I, I kind of got, <clears throat> social media was using me. So I was giving, I was doing what, like, do you know what I mean, like you've just said. So now I look back and think, what a fucking idiot you are in. Yeah. But... At the time, I was getting that much abuse. So I thought, whatever well, you're giving us abuse, I'm going to give you a reason to. And what you just said is so true because, like, when I think about even myself trying to build up my social uh, social media, um, it's almost like be careful what you wish for because Aye. in five years' time, if if and when I've got hundreds of thousands, millions of followers, yeah. and my podcast is blowing up, the downside is going to be abuse to me abuse, and Aye. also also to my family. That's why I rarely put anything on my, my wife is never on yeah. now. I don't even follow her on my social media, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and I post a occasionally on my story just on my kids and, and that's it um, because I know there's going to be some wanker out, out, out there who's going to go oh I'm going to say something to him to try and antagonise him they want to bite yeah it's they like do they want to bite but like how sad if you, if you have to sit on social media to get people all to try and bite it's like it's yeah. a weird world we live in these days it's so weird it's so weird on the uh, thing about social media again doing a bit of my homework and yeah. just, just reading bits and pieces um it's a bit of a funny one, actually. There was someone else on the reality TV show called uh, Only Way is Essex Towie. Yeah. Guy called Lewis Bloor was calling yeah, you was... out on social media yeah, 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 about, yeah, yeah. about fighting. Yes. Now, admittedly, I had never watched until yesterday any of your MMA fights. So you were on Bama. Yeah. And then you was on Bellator, uh, Bellator yeah. which is a big deal. I mean, I don't know. I would say UFC is probably the household the brand. The pinnacle in it, yeah. Then you've got Bellator, but not too far behind. And then yeah. you've got like, kind of like, the is it one, one championship? So, yeah, so a lot, so since I, since I first started fighting, there's been a few come up, like you won championships and there's a one called the PFL. Okay. They're putting like big, like tournaments on where eight man tournaments and they win a million, stuff like that, do you know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah, there's been a few big ones, but yeah, Bellator was, they've got a fucking, it's like some fighters from UFC go Bellator, Bellator UFC, it was kind of like, yeah. you know, back and yeah. forth. Yeah, you got uh, champions going, to their champions going to there and, yeah. and then and look listen if you're going to fight a UFC fight or a Bellator fight they're the real deal yeah, they're, not, they're not a joke anyway going back to it I was thinking I don't know Lewis yeah, yeah, yeah I don't yeah. know him so it'd be very wrong of me to say anything which is um, just a guess yeah but from his social media looks like he keeps himself in good nick you know yeah. he's a per personal trainer but I watched you fight and I've got to say Aaron you're fucking hard as nails. You're a tough, tough fella. <laughs> that's it, no, that's you it. are. You are. I'm not just yeah. saying it. You're a fucking tough motherfucker. I wouldn't want to fight you in a street fight. Maybe we might do a bit of sparring <laughs> on Sunday, Sunday and I'll, I'll, I'll get a bit of a taste for it. But I'm thinking, Lewis, like, I don't know you and maybe you've got something in your locker that I don't know, but really and truly, you'd get ironed out by, by Aaron if that happened. Do you know what it was him that attacked me. So I was, um, I was on a flight. I was on a flight to Australia. Um, and the Wi-Fi was on and off and I went on me I think it was at the time I think it was Twitter and I just had loads of tweets from Lewis Blow obviously over a previous relationship obviously he was pissed and he was fucking saying yeah wait I see you me and you fucking fighting blah 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 and all this because he had he had one boxing fight but he fought some he fought some um, Heavy D remember Heavy D yeah from I Big think Brother so. yeah, yeah, he yeah. fought him which obviously yeah. is not really a fight yeah. but anyway so I've got to, uh, like, it's come on. So I'm, I'm on the Twitter and I'm, I'm, I'm on the plane and it was going off. So I had to wait till I landed. But then by the time I had landed, a few hours later, they were gone. So obviously he must have been drunk. So then I thought, fuck it. So I was fuming. So um, I just started biting on social media. Um, then I just put up, you know, you know, Snatch. When he yeah. says, fuck you, I'll do the fight for free. Yeah. So I just posted that. I just posted that on my Instagram. Cause he was he was on about making money or something from it so i just put fuck you i'll do the fight for free as the picture with the caption then i just tagged lewis blowing it 
they went fucking mental. <laughs> and then obviously, thing must have fizzled out with him in, in in one of my previous exes. And then after one of my fights, he just said, "Oh look, congratulations." So I think it was just. I don't think it was ever going to happen, but obviously, he had started it, so I just played along with it. You know what I mean? It, it never, it never happened. But I think I, I don't even, I don't know him. I've never met him. Yeah. Uh, have I met him? I don't think I've met him. But I, from I, I've, I've never even looked at his social media for God knows how many years. Well, look, the facts are, if that was on the table right now, Aaron against Lewis Blur, um, and and it was in the O2. Regardless if you've both got some kind of fighting pedigree or not, that makes it very interesting. Both got a great following. Both been on reality TV. Mm. It would fucking sell out, wouldn't yeah. it? It would probably sell out. It's it's a one of the, probably back then it would have when there was when there was like obviously it looked like there was real like animosity between them. But like I say, I just replied. He's obviously got pissed, <laughs> and it's got in and it's in his in the, his. I can't even remember the tweets. It was just fucking loads, loads and loads of tweets one after the other. And then by the time I landed, they were gone. But uh, I, there's, you know, there's, there's people like like Lewis, who, like I said, I've, I've never met, so I don't, I don't really, I don't know him. Who there's, there's fights like that along the way for us, like your Jack Fincham. Jack Fincham's fighting in April. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? He's got a big following. I've got a big following. I like Jack. I've spoken to Jack, um, but he's apparently a decent boxer. Yeah. I fancy myself as I'm coming on. I'm a decent boxer, so who knows? These kind of fights down the line might make sense. They might very. If you thought Jack Fincham, I mean, he's a top guy. You're a top uh, guy. I think. Uh, I think that would definitely set out. But I like Jack. I, I like. I mean, I, I'm glad guy. he's 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 getting back on his feet and he's training and he's boxing because, like I say, it saved me from the path that I was going down. And by the looks of it, he's getting back in shape and it's helping him. So fucking fair play to him. Yeah. Oh, so on that note, because obviously it's a perfect time to talk about that. Then I mean, look, we've all gone through challenges. Yeah. Um, everyone's got their vices. Everyone's got their their devils on their shoulder. Um, no one on this world walking around today is perfect. No one is. Okay. No, no one. Jack. Jack. Jack explained everything, and now he found boxing and he found his path again. He seems like he's in a really good place, and I really want the best for him. Yourself, I know you've been quite vocal on your own social media. I mentioned to you off camera earlier that I saw a post that you said, 10 months since I've been uh, clean. Yeah. And um, I actually didn't know uh, until that point that there was ever a kind of, uh, not a problem, but a challenge with like alcohol or, or anything else. So could you tell me a little bit more about that? No, it was, a, it was a massive problem. It was a massive problem. So I was always, when I was younger, I never used to drink. I didn't drink till I was 18. Didn't have a drink till I was 18. Then I was always into my fitness. I was always into like weightlifting, but I was always in good shape. I used to be like a topless host when I was younger in the nightclubs and stuff. So I was always in good shape. Went off show, I was always in the gym. Then I started Jodie's show. And then because I was always on the road, I never, st- I kind of stopped training and I was just drinking fucking loads. It come to a head two years ago. Two years ago this month was my last, was my last fight in MMA. Um, so I had the fight. I kind of fell out with my coach just before the fight, so I didn't have a coach for the last four weeks. So I was just fucking, I wasn't really training. So I thought, fucking, I'll have this last, it was in my head, it was my last MMA fight. I'll have this fight and I'll just get paid. Had the fight, kid fucking elbowed me face off for three rounds, got beat. Um, and then two weeks later, we went into lockdown, the first lockdown, when the whole corona started. <clears throat> so that was in that was in the Feb, then the April, April the 10th, my son was born. So everything was like, because I'd lost the fight, I was drinking heavily in between until my son was born. And I think the night before my son was born, I went out. I think I went out on um, to my cousins, and I got and I was and I was drinking all day, all night there. Coming the next morning, obviously my missus is in the house, pregnant. You know what I mean? So I wasn't a nice person. I didn't care. All I cared about back then was myself. So she's woke us up. I was I in the bed. She woke us up. Our waters had broke, so she's went into the hospital had the baby come out and it was all new to me there was a fucking I had a newborn baby do you know what I mean and obviously it was all it was amazing but then I just we we were in lockdown money money was drying up do you know what I mean and I just started fucking drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking and then it come to a head around July my message was just 2020 2020 she said look I'm I'm, I'm taking the kid I'm leaving and I just didn't I was like right bye then didn't care she, she went back down to Brighton for like six weeks with my son and I just went I just fucking when she moved out I just hit rock bottom I just went for it I just thought fuck this I'm just going to drink myself to oblivion it's funny because like I've been through similar sort of episodes at Aaron like, in my life and you know 
when I've had too much to drink and I turn into a, this other person, you kind of it masks who you really are yeah. and that fuck it mentality That's whether, it whether it's towards your friends your family your business to yourself as an individual the, the self-worth is, is gone and you're yeah. just like fuck everything and at the time you it think that's like the self, best self-destruction yeah it's like you think it's the best decision yeah at the time because it's all emotional based and it's you're pushing the fuck it button you're just like right it was, was a self-destruct button yeah, I was like bang. right she's gone boom bang, yeah. I'm gone I'm gone for this but you're de delaying the inevitable aren't we you know it's like eventually the reality is going to kick in you're like oh my god what have everything I done? is falling apart I what have I done yeah so I was for so it was like, like you see I pressed that self-destruct button when she moved out and I just fucking went every single day for six weeks drinking 10 15 bottles big bottles a day <clears> doing all sorts do, do you know what I mean doing all like bad things like fucking as you know what people do so six weeks in I remember I woke up one day and I went downstairs and there was fucking bottles bottles all over the house just and I was looking at my house and I was like I'm a, I'm a quite I'm a house proud person like I mean, I mean like the house is always immaculate I come downstairs and I was just like what the fuck am I doing looked in the mirror fat like I had long hair at the time just I just looked I looked about 40 years old how much did you weigh 90 kilos man. I was probably heavier probably about 92 kilo wow 92 and my fight before that was like 70 72 do you know what I mean? So I was 20 kilo. In, so I've, I've, I've rang, I've rang Talia and I was just like, I think I broke you. And I was just like, look, I fucked this. I fucked it. I was like, can you come up and see us? So she was like, you're not going to stop drinking. So on the phone, I think it was on the phone. I said, right, I'm going to stop drinking for a year. And she was like, you won't do it. You, you're like, because all the promises in the past had been a lie. And I was like, nah, I'm, I'm going to do it. I've got a meeting at the end of the week to, to have a boxing fight, to get us back in, uh, get us back up and running. So she's come back up, started talking. A few days, few days down, I wasn't drinking. Started thinking, right, I had this boxing meeting. Uh, had signed to fight a big name. I'll not say who, because it will happen later in the year. Had signed to fight a big name for like a hundred and something grand, right? And then I was thinking about it. And looking at the fight now, the, the fight, I was getting well underpaid to get my head punched off. So then I've moved down about three weeks in. To, me and the missus were back together. Things were starting to go good. Um, Josh Kelly, I was a friend with Josh, but my missus was a friend with his wife. So she's talking to uh, Josh's wife and she's like, can you try and get Aaron down the gym? I think it'll be good for him. So Josh is on the phone to Adam, like trying to get us down. And then he said, like, right, bring him down. So I went in, this was about four weeks after the meeting, four weeks sober. Four, I was four weeks sober the, the day I went in the gym. Um, and then Adam was like, right. And th this is what stuck in my head. He said, if you want to train here, if you want to be in this gym, in training with the professionals, I want you to live like a professional. I don't want, cause I, I, I don't want you to drink, cause I was fucking massive. Don't want you to drink, and I want you to live like an athlete and show me that you deserve to be here. So and that was it. I thought, right, this is me fucking last chance. This is I'm being given a chance by a fucking a world class coach to show what I can do. So I've done a whole year off the drink. I had another baby. Fucking me and the missus are. We are better than ever. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm probably, I'm a fucking, and obviously I know every dad says this, but I'm, I'm an amazing dad and I'm an amazing partner now. But back then I wasn't. But I feel like I had to go through that to realise what I, what I was, what I had. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I kicked me, I kicked me fucking, well, not kicked me, my missus and my son left us and my, and my stepdaughter. And I, I did, like I say, I didn't care. But looking back now, I think, fucking hell, Aaron. Mm -hmm. Like, I was in a position where I was literally would have lost it all. Mm -hmm. I would have lost it all. I wouldn't have had a career. And now fast forward 18 months, I'm just about to announce tomorrow. I'm not going to see it. We're just about to announce the boxing tomorrow. A huge, huge platform. And the fight that I had signed 18 months ago, I'm going to try and get at the end of this year. And I'll, bet I'll get paid 10 times more than I was on the first fight. So, yeah, I feel like the self-destruct button was fucking, was thoroughly smashed down. Boom, right, I'm going for this. I'm going to, and I didn't care. I didn't care. Some days I used to think, I don't give a fuck. I'll just drink yourself into oblivion. I don't give a fuck if I don't wake up. Because I didn't, I didn't have anything. Do you I, know what I mean? I was going to ask, even though it's a really difficult question for mm. me to ask you, but like, su su suicidal thoughts? Nah, was there never, anything like that? Never, ever. Never. Never, ever that. But got to the point where I just didn't care. I didn't care how I... I I've always been one for my appearance. Obviously not now I'm in full camp. But religiously, haircut every week, beard, eyebrows. Like, look after myself. 
And I just remember looking in the mirror after this this fucking self-destruct button and I was just a fucking, I was a mess. I had bags. I was just horrible. I just looked horrible. And I thought, what the fuck are you doing? And I've got a son. I've got, I had a son who was meant to look up to us. Everyone that knows is all I ever wanted was a son. Now I've got two. Do you know what I mean? And I Incredible. like, uh, it's, I, I changed my life. I changed my whole life around in 18 months. And I feel like it's because of me missus, me kids and people at the gym. And I thought I had all these friends. I thought I had all these friends in Newcastle. Yeah, I've got loads of friends. I, if I, I've got loads of people to go out with. See, since I don't go out, I haven't got any friends, mate. Mm. I've got no friends. I've got. I've probably got five friends that I speak to on the phone. See, when I used to drink in fucking party, I had a hundred. Had a hundred friends. I could ring the phone. Do you want to come out? Yeah, let's go. Yeah, of course I want to come out because they're getting everything for free. Mm. See, when I see now, I don't want to drink. And I, do you want to go for a coffee? I've got five friends that I've seen. In the last 18 months, I've only seen five people out outside of my family, bar the lads at the gym. Yeah. Whereas I feel like Mick, Josh, lads in the gym, of these, like Adam, are big friends, Charlie, big friends for life now. Do you know what I mean? But like I say, I had all these friends in Newcastle, which now I look at as just, they were just associates. Yeah. Who I associate with fucking drinking. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a bad time for us, mate. It was a bad time. And I feel like if I wasn't so determined I wouldn't be sitting here now that, yeah. and that's a fucking 100% of fact yeah the last the last thing I want to say because it's something that I can't totally relate to because I I'm not let's call uh, television famous or got a big social media yeah, following yeah, yeah. yet but it was the same conversation I had with Jack Fincham he said that you know when he was rock bottom you know, feeling quite suicidal, depressed, etc. Cetera, et cetera. It's a bit of a weird paradox because in one light, you've got a massive following and you walk out on the street and people know you and people yeah. come over to you. But then in the next thing, he had no money. You know, it had all gone. So it was almost like he had, he had one world where everything was looked great, but in the other world, in reality, it wasn't. And the same question to you is like, when you're feeling that low, because like I've been skint, I've been broke, right? I've, I've so made I'm money in. and I've also been skint, but I've never had a big following. So when you're kind of skint, no one knows you, you can kind of go, all right, well, sort of be upset, but then then pick yourself back up. But to have a big following, but then also have feel like you've got nothing, yeah. that must be a hard world to live in. Do you know what it is? Everyone thinks people from TV has got money. Do you know what I mean? Like... You look at social media. No, you, no one posts bad stuff on social media. No one posts the fucking bank account that's got fucking no money in. Everyone, it's social media is a thing where you want, you want people to think you've got money. Oh, he drives this car. He's got that. He's got this watch. He's, do you know what I mean? He's got a. And, and that's what you want people to see is social media. But in real life, half the people on social media, a lot of people have got no money. I went. I I did hit. Like I was. I did, I was got to the point where I had very, very, not not much money. But I had a house. I had a house that I had done. I had done all my building work and I paid everything in cash. So now I know there's massive equity in my house. So I hit rock bottom. I didn't hit. I didn't go skin. I've always had money. Do you know what I mean? I'm not. I'm not that thick. Where it's like blowing it all. Do you know what I mean? But you see people on social media. They've got fucking Dior trainers on. They've got this jacket. They've got this. But they haven't. They don't own a fucking. They don't own yeah, a house. So or they, really they live. They live in. They live in like a. <clears throat> the, if you look at the, they live in a one bedroom squat rented. Do you know what I mean? But they've got. They've got five grand's worth of fucking clothes on. It's like that's social media. Yeah. Like look at me. I look rich when in real life you're not. Mm. Whereas now, <laughs> I wear fuck. This is this is probably one of the only name tops I've got. I will live in ASOS tracksuits. I live in. People want to send us tracksuits. I don't buy anything. I've got a house. I'm I'm trying to save to build a bigger house. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. but yeah, social media is a like Jack's saying. Everyone on social media would think Jack's got money, but like you say, he was broke. But he's never going to show that on social media because you just put yourself out there for more fucking abuse. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So it's a it's a it's a constant vicious circle. So th so right, talk about now then. So um, obviously the MMA. Yeah. That must have been quite a challenge. The first question I want to ask you about that is. Have you always been into, you said earlier about fitness, weightlifting, etc. I think a lot of alpha male type people kind of get into that when they're younger. Yeah. Including me, you know, I was always following like the, the bodybuilders and trying to look like them. Yeah, 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 yeah. But was fighting, you know, really something in your DNA or was something you kind of just developed into off the back end of Geordie Shaw? I never had a fight in my life. Not even in through school. I was never one in school, you know, but like, oh, having a fight. I never, I didn't have one fight in school. 
I, I didn't I, I didn't want to fight. I was I was a very shy kid. I didn't I didn't like confrontation. Um, and then when I stopped playing football, I was playing decent level football, getting paid on a Saturday, and then that, that fizzled out. So then I just started doing you know my Muay Thai for yeah. fitness. Started doing bits of Muay Thai only for a year, just classes. Then I just left it. I went offshore and I just didn't think of any anything of fighting. And I was sitting on I was in Bulgaria with my agent. This was when I was on Jordy Show. I think okay. I was twenty nine. And he was like, Aaron, what do you want to do after Jordy Show? Like what what what's your path? People are making people are having clove labels, people are doing this. And I said, I said, do you know what I want to do? One thing I want to have before I'm 30 is an MMA fight. And he just looked at us and he was like, Are you serious? And I was like, Yeah. And he was like, My brother in law is the matchmaker for Bama. Right? So I was sitting on the beach in Bulgaria, fucking I was drinking pints, right? I was drinking pints. And he was like, Right, let's do it. And I was like, right, okay, and didn't think anything of it. So about four months later, I think that was in no, what, that was in the September. So it was like the following, the following year, the following year in the March. He was like, right, you're fighting and you're fighting in May. It was a week before my thirtieth birthday. You're fighting in May, and I was like, what do you mean I'm fighting? He's like, I've signed you to fight, Bam. He said, like, that's what you wanted. And I was like, be careful what you I, wish for I, again. I was yeah, like, Fuck. <laughs> I was like, I, I'm never trained. I was fucking. I hadn't trained. I was drinking all over Christmas, so I, was, I wasn't in shape. And I had a lad in Birmingham. My mate in Birmingham, who's now me, me, it's me kid's godparents, he was training with, do you know UFC Leon Edwards? Uh, rings a bell. Right, so, and I would just, I packed my bag that day and I moved to Birmingham for eight weeks. Done an eight week camp, got in there, and I didn't know much about my opponent. He was like, zero, zero, he's never had a fight. And I was thinking, he's never had a fight, so where the fuck they found this kid? Went on Insta- went on uh, YouTube, the kid had, had 35 Thai boxing fights. So this was the week of the fight. I'm thinking, he's going to fucking punch my head off. He's going to punch me head off. But I'm the type of person where I've signed for it now and I'm not backing out. I will, never, I will never bottle anything in my life. I'm not scared of anything. So I've got in there and I thought, right. And me, me, the coach said, he, he went, this is, a, you're either going to fight or flight. And I went in there and as soon as the bell went, I just, whew, that was it. I was like, right, we're fucking having the fight. And I just, I, I, I was only wanted one fight. I didn't want any more. So fuck this, I'm on one and that's it. Then I won, and that feeling I got at the win, I thought, nah, this is it. This is what I want to do. And then that's when I started changing it into the MMA. But I think my first fight, I had about seven weeks. Should never, ever have been in there after seven weeks. I didn't mm. have a clue. But I just went into just fight mode, and it fucking worked. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It worked. And how did it feel? Obviously, Bama's, you know, you know the real deal. I but walked then... out in front of 4,000 people and made booing us. Really? In Birmingham. The whole arena was booing us. Why were they booing you? Because I was Jordy Shaw. Because Jordy Shaw were filming there as well. Oh, right, okay. So obviously the fourth, like I say, people, were, people, MMA fighters in Birmingham were saying it should be me on the card, mm. but take it back to the 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 thingy. I'm the selling all, yeah. And on the back of me being on the card, they got a, Bama got a TV deal, BBC Three or, or something like it was a, it was a like a mainstream TV deal because I yeah. was on it. So straight away, me, me me first fight, I was fucking. I think I was the one below call me an event. My first ever fight, 4,000 people on TV, Jordy Shaw filming. So it's not like I, I had all this pressure and I thought, I can't fucking lose this fight. So that's what I'm saying. I just went. I was that fucked. I finished him in the first round, but I was that tired, right? I was that tired. I couldn't even climb the cage at the end to celebrate. <laughs> couldn't get up. What was it like, though, when you you um, stepped through uh, into the arena when you uh, was fighting on Bellator? I mean, because that's a, that's a massive, massive brand. So the Bellator fight, right? I've never been as fired up. There was a, I was fighting a lad from who's from the northeast, and for the whole twelve week camp, he was he was just I'm gonna fucking knock him out. Apparently, he's a bit of a bully boy from where he's from. He's a bit of a bully, like in the local area, which I only I didn't find that out until after. So apparently, he's a bit of a bully boy. So he's trying he's doing all these videos. I'm gonna fucking knock him out. If he beats me, I'll never show me face again and all this and. Const, con, constant, 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 just going at his, going at his, and I just, I didn't have me, I didn't have Twitter or anything. I was just that fired up. I thought I'm gonna fucking kill this kid. I'm gonna fucking kill him. And I remember I come to the weigh-in, right? And as soon as we met, like it wasn't even the weigh-in. It was the day before we had a face to face. And he's looking at us, and I think he obviously on TV. I must have been smaller. And he's looking at us, and I just had pure fire in my eyes. I thought I'm gonna fucking kill you. I didn't say anything. I just thought I'm gonna kill you. Then we done the weigh-in, and he didn't make weight. He didn't make weight. He come after me. He's like, "Are you still gonna take the fight?" Like, come up and try and shake my hand. He's still gonna take the fight. I said, "I'm not gonna take the fight, mate." I said, "I'm gonna fucking kill you tomorrow night." And I just seen he's he's shit. He shit his pants. That he got out the lift and he shit himself. And I thought I've won this fight. I've won it. And he's come out. 
come out in the round and I just he hit us I think I was getting off the kit off the floor and he fucking needed us in the face and he just woke the, the fucking sleeping honestly I just was he needed us I was just that rage and I thought that's it you're fucking dead and I just hit him with a one two and he went through and I choked him out and even afterwards after the fight he come up to us he went he went I didn't realise you were so big so he lost that fight the minute we went toe to toe he went I didn't realise you were so tall but I was in shape I had, I had smashed the camp every other fight beforehand four, week, four weeks before the fight I would go on a bender so then in my head I thought if I lose I know for a fact that's why I've lost yeah. but this one I didn't because I was that determined to fucking beat him but then Bellator that was it was the day before my birthday my 31st birthday okay so I had the fight, then I went on a fucking mad bender in London for two days after. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, not, not the way to live, but it's just the life I was living at the time. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But, um, so yeah, I was given big opportunities. Do you know what I mean? I probably, if I had a, if I had a stuck to Bellator and lived like I was now, I would have fought in America and everything. But I fucked it. So um, transitioning now over to, to boxing, mm. I mean, I've got to say as well, there's, there's, you're obviously under Adam Booth, uh, yeah. who's a formidable boxing trainer, David Hay, George Groves, a um, bunch of other elite fighters. And um, obviously now you've got Mick Condon around you, Josh Kelly, Harlem Eubank, uh, who else is there? Abbas. Abbas, Shannon Courtney. And then on the other side, you've got Jermaine Brown, yeah. Dan Morley. Uh, so just surrounded by talent, really, uh, isn't it? Uh, trying, to, trying to clue everyone. Lacon. Yeah, there's yeah, there's yeah. so many good people down there. Not just because of their boxing ability, but how they are as individuals. Yeah. You know, and there's lots of different big, good personalities there. Some have you know, got big banter, like yeah. Nick Condon. Other people quite humble, but they're obviously very professional what they do. Yeah. And I think it's just a healthy environment. What was it? What's it like working with that family of of of, of professionals? For me, it's like um, I've been. Lo- I've learned so much about myself and everything. Like I said, I live with Mick. I li- I've lived with Mick for phew, the past year. Do you know what I mean? So me and Mick are in a similar position. We've both got young kids. We we'll both live away from a family, so we're kind of kind of works. Do you know what I mean? We we'll bounce off each other. But I I just take a leaf out of Mick's book. Like I've never met someone so mentally strong in my life is him you know the first time I ever met him first time I met you as well wasn't on the same day was on them bloody hills at Box Hill in Surrey which are which are brutal and I saw him on there obviously I knew who he was because I'm a big boxing fan myself and I've seen him I mean I've always thought he's an incredible fighter and um I was running and I was running with one of my friends who actually works for us upstairs uh, Sam he's one of the sales agents and Sam's really fit yeah he's a footballer and um Anyway, so Sam's taken off. And as Mick's run past me, he went, are you going to let him fucking beat you? That was the first thing he said to me. And Aye. it got me going. I was like, no, Aye. no. And I started pelting off the Sam. And I was thinking, this guy is, 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 he's, is a he's, joker. Aye. Yeah. You know what he gets everyone, He gets everyone fired up, like on the hills. And there's been, t- like my first day, my very first day at the gym, right? So I've done the boxing in the morning. And then I had hills, you know, the incline hills. Yeah. 12 and 12? 12. 12 and 12. I do that in a week. Yeah, so, it's hard, isn't it? Well, I was 90 fucking kilo. So I went to Mick. Adam was like, right, you're training with Mick tonight, Hill. So Mick was like, right, give us a message. So we got there and he went 12 12s. So I said, oh, 12 rounds. And he went, obviously it's 10, isn't it? He went, it fucking is now. And I was like, what do you mean? He went, it's normally 10, but you've just said 12. So we're doing 12. Yeah, yeah. Fuck me, mate. I was, I he, he fucked me. He went, Mick was even says, he'll tell you now, he was trying to break us. He tried to break us. So I started on 12 12, right? And I was fucking, he was like, don't you fucking dare hang on. And for the benefit of people listening, 12 12 means 12 speed. 12 incline. So I'm 90 kilos. I've jumped on this treadmill and I was, I think I've done six at 12 12, right? And my legs. A minute on, minute off. Yeah, and my legs would, wouldn't go. So Mick was like, right, drop it down. 11 and a half, 11 and a half. So I'm doing it and I'm just, I know that he's, he's trying to test us. And I'm trying to hold on. I said, don't fucking hold on. So I've done the 12-12, right? And I was on the floor and I thought my lungs were going to fall <laughs> out my ass. And I was like, fuck this. I can't do this. I can't do this. And then the next day, he beasted us all week. And then I went home on, I think I'd done the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I went home on the Thursday. And Adam was like, do, do track. So on the Thursday, I've drove home on the Wednesday night, right? Six hour drive. I drove home to Newcastle. I've done track. I've done 10 400s on the track. 10, yeah, 10 400s. So I sent Adam the times. He was like, right, the times are like 135s, 140s, terrible, because I was fucking heavy. So then I've, stupidly, I've drove back down on the Friday morning at five o'clock in the morning to then do fucked up Friday. 
beasted as it fucked up Friday, and then I drove back home on the Friday afternoon, another six hour drive, and I remember sitting there, and I just said to my missus, I can't do this. I said, I can't fucking compete with them. And she's like, Aaron, you have to. She's like, this, it's, what's, what's, it's what's gonna get you back in the boxing. And I don't think anyone expected us to come back the week after. Boom, Monday morning, I was there. And they were like, are you back for another week? And I was like, yep, yeah. back. And I feel like, and then I was there, and then I just, I feel like they realized I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't, in that 18 month late, I'm still fucking there. And I haven't had a fight, but I feel like I've needed all that learning time to, when I get in there, the people think, fucking hell, he can actually box. Yeah. So, but mentally, I, mentally Mick try to fuck us. And he, he half, he half succeeded, but he didn't think I would last as long as I have. And like I say, he's one of my best pals. We're fucking, I'm with him every day. Yeah, good man. So um, you get to spa, I guess, Mick, <sighs> Josh, fucking that. Josh Kelly. Um, there's obviously a bunch of other great professionals down there. I mean, so talk me through it, like the people that you sparred, um, the pros and cons sparring these, these, these great athletes. So obviously the pros is I'm in there with high, high level opposition who will let me do a bit of work. The downside is when they want to switch it on me, they can fucking turn it on. Do you know what I mean? And it's like sometimes I just go into survival mode and I just think... Trying to weather it. The only good thing for me is I've got that fight in us. I've got no quit. So the other week, I was about two weeks ago, I had done like nine rounds of sparring in the other ring and Adam was like, He's like, you're, you're going to get fucked now. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, you're going to get fucked. So he put he put everyone around the ring on the ropes. He said, right, go. Mick's just come in. Bang, he smacked his. And I was like, whoa. So he just went hell for leather for 30 seconds. He went, right, another one. Harlem's jumped in the ropes, 30 seconds. So I had to do I had to do four minutes with 30, a new opponent. Every th- but every 30 seconds, they were putting it on us. So I was just like four minutes. He was like, right, have a break. Minute down, he went, right, go again. So I had to do another three minutes. And afterwards he went, he went, there's one thing he went, he went, I know you've got, he went, one thing I can't question is your heart. Yeah. And I was like, fucking hell. And like, cause I didn't have time to think about it. I didn't have time for the anxiety to kick in. He just went, you're going to get fucked. And I was standing in the middle of the ring and he went, right, go. And Mick just smacked us. And I was like, what the fuck? And then yeah. it was survival mode. Do you know what I mean? But it was good. It was the gritty, the grit that I needed. Like towards the end, I was just like talking off thinking, fuck this, just swing, just swing. And as long as I'm hitting them, I don't give a fuck if they're hitting me. But it, it was good. You said you said about uh, I think that's such an important word, heart. So with like any athlete in any sport, but specifically yeah. boxing or, or or fighting, I think it is number one that heart because you could have all the skill in the world, all the experience, but if you have no heart or no bottle, uh, when the going gets tough, it's easy. Then it means no, it means nothing. So like. What would you say learning from MMA now boxing is some of the most important characteristics you need in order to become a success? That you need dedication. Like I I I lived away for my first two years of MMA and I won every fight. I moved home to train at, at home. I had a cracking coach, a well known coach. He's a, he's an SBG, so SBG franchise from Ireland from McGregor's gym. This coach was a f- uh, former Cage Warriors uh, featherweight champion and I, because I was at home I was too comfortable Yeah. so instead of going to training I'd be like ah fuck I go out with the boys and miss training sessions and I, I couldn't understand why he was so angry at us all the time looking back now obviously now I see because obviously he seen something in there the heart where if you've got heart everything else can, can be built on yeah. You can have all the skill in the world, but you can't you can't build heart. Do you know what I mean? You can't if you haven't got that in you, you're never gonna have it. Whereas I know I've got that heart, so the skill set will come. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I feel like the heart and dedication is the main one, and you just have to like I say, it would have been easy to I could have quit ten times over. I live away from my family, I live down here, I don't see my kids as much, but I know the end goal in my head what's gonna be. And I know that's what, what, and my missus knows, like, we have a plan and we know what's coming. So the sacrifice now, me being away now, means in three years' time, I can be a stay-at-home dad and I can make up for all that. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So you have to sacrifice. Yeah, I'm sacrificing, seeing, like, seeing my kids, like, like over short periods of time. Do you know what I mean? But I know that it's all going to pay off. Definitely, that's that's the biggest thing. So you have to you have to be willing to sacrifice for y- you, your kids, your missus. Because if I was at home, if Adam's gym was in Newcastle, 
I wouldn't be in the position I'm in because it's too easy. It's home home life is just too comfortable for me. You have to that's, go 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 all in. That's for me personally. You have to, I have to be away. This to me is like my job. I go away and I fucking work my ass off. Then when I go home, I spend time with my family. Well, um, Anthony Joshua says something really good. I think it was AJ Off Limits. It was like a um, uh, uh, like a podcast type interview by Sky, and it was called I I think AJ Off Limits, and he said something really really key in this podcast which was when i'm in the uk i treat the uk as my prison sentence to boxing yeah so i might have a 10 year 15 year prison sentence and everything is to do with boxing i live like uh an sas kind of army marine all dedicate my life to, towards boxing when i go away on holiday that's when i get my little break i can have a drink or whatever else yeah but yeah, when yeah. i come back i'm in that prison sentence until I've reached all my goals and then I walk out of there like uh, like, a, like a free man. And I think that's a kind of mindset that you've got now. Exactly that, exactly that. Like I don't, like me and my missus will have a date, one date night a month, like, but everything, my whole life revolves around the boxing, not even just my life, her life, the kid's life. When I'm home, she cooks, makes sure all my meals are cooked and healthy. And we'll have like the odd, the odd, the odd dessert, or we have a date night where I'll, I'll enjoy myself. But everything to me now for the next three years is boxing, and she knows that. And I think you also have to have a supportive partner who is not going to be like you, you couldn't be in the boxing game and have someone ringing you every day saying, "Ah, you're not fucking seeing your kids. You're not seeing me. You're not giving." You have to have someone supportive because if you haven't. It will never work. Um, um, you said something earlier, which I was going to touch on, but then obviously we're talking about something else. And oh, I sorry. totally forgot. But like when you said uh, you're, make, you're making money, obviously, because you've got your, your profile. And because of that, it allows you to immerse yourself in the boxing and live yeah. that life, which is important. I'm going through, again, I'm not trying to be professional, but I've, I've got a little taste of the kind of life that you were, were, were explaining. I've got to get up at five o'clock in the morning, go to boxing booth, yeah. train. Then I've got to come to work meet clients, promote, do content, podcasts, etc. I get home, put my son to bed, well, both my sons to bed, and then I've got to go back into the gym. Yeah. And, I, and to be honest, for this boxing cat, I've been finding it very, very tough because it's trying to balance the family life, the work life, the training life, and, and then also not getting pulled because... Overnight, in the morning, I feel like I'm the most disciplined person in the world. Mm. I do the, the, the plunge pool, ice bath, I'm training my bollocks off. But then of an, of an evening, when I feel a bit tired, I think, I could eat that chocolate now, no. or I could do this. And, and my and my kind of threshold starts to become lower. Yeah. And I've really, really noticed it this time around. Maybe because of my age, because I'm 36. That was like me on, in the when I lived at home and doing the MMA. The first session was always easy. Get up, go to the first session, but then I think, well, I've done one session, I can just miss the second one. And that's where the, ment the mentality comes in, where you, you have to be strong, because let's be honest, you're going in there to fight someone who's fucking trying to knock your head off. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's, we're not, we're in a sport where pe you're gonna get, you can get fucking knocked spark out, do you know what I mean? So, yeah. exactly what you're saying. So, for, like, what you're doing is, is 10 times harder in a way than what I'm doing. You're balancing training, work clients home misses training whereas i'm just getting up living here i get up i train i rest i train so your life's harder than mine in certain aspects do you know what i mean so fucking fair play to you do you know what i mean you, you but it's something you you want to do something that you love yeah. doing so but then i would say your opposition is going to be a higher level than my opposition probably yeah you so know? My, my, like, that's yeah. what i'm saying so it, it kind of swings in yeah. roundabouts do you know what i mean but I like when I finish all the boxing stuff. I'll, I'll still have that mentality because now me, it's in my head of training. Yeah. Like I want my kids to grow up and sit, be like in a fit family. Like I want the the family to be all into sports or whatever they want to choose. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I don't want my kids growing up and seeing the old me sitting drinking, sitting drinking, fucking they playing video games all day every day. I don't want that. So the mentality I've got now is something I want to install into my kids and hopefully. Like my missus' dad was was a professional footballer. He was Brighton captain. Do you okay. know what I mean? So I would love them to go down the route of the football or rugby or any kind of sport. I would love them to be involved in at a high level. Yeah, like so. My dad's got uh, was it six brothers, one one sister. And if you look at the brothers, three three of them are 
high performers. One of them used to play for Chelsea. He's actually still with, within football at the moment as, yeah. a, as a professional, but coaching coaches. And then the other three brothers, sadly, one of them's dead now. Um, two of them died, actually. All got into drugs, heroin, that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's weird. You split them down the middle. It's fine, like, half of them are really successful. H- half of them are just, well, they were ba- basically down big losers. There's a fine line, though. You yeah. go one, you start one way, you, you drift off. Ah, I'll just have a few drinks. Or you drift off. You know, I'm going to miss that Friday night. I'm going to go to the gym. Go to the gym on a Friday night. You'll see how fucking dedicated people yeah. are. Because on a Friday night, the end of the working week, everyone wants to go out. Yeah. And then you see, I seen a thing on Instagram. George Masvidal has said, people. you see people going out on a Thursday, a Friday, a Saturday, and it comes to a Monday, and they wonder why they're getting outperformed by everyone in the office and not getting a raise. Do so you know true. I mean? but, so um, just to round off the boxing stuff, and there's one more couple of questions I want to yeah, ask yeah. you. What do you want to achieve out of the sport and boxing? You're 34 years of age now. You've still got plenty, plenty of time. I and mean, we're seeing boxers now go to 45, 50 years mm-hmm. of age. And I think with all the, the team that you've got around you, nutrition, the rest, the recovery, etc., you really can push your career beyond. Yeah. But what do you want to achieve from it? So when I first went to the gym, I just wanted it. I was like, right, I want to have a few fights and make a bit of money. But it's it's kind of past the money now because I think the money's the money's always going to be there because of the background that I've got. So if I can, I want to, I want to go down a route where I'm I'm having fights like even talk of Northern Area title. Do you know what I mean? Right in Newcastle, I get Northern Area title under my belt or something along those lines. But with having some big name fights along the way, do you know what I mean? I'm not there's names I want to mention, but I'm not going to mention them because. I'll come back. You know the names I'm yeah. going to say. So once I've had a few fights, I'll come back and do a podcast again. Once them fights are done, and we'll say, I told you so. Okay, and then beyond boxing then, because I know you said selling off your social media, you know, having a private account, and that sounds great, but you're a go-getter. So I yeah. know you're not just going to sit down on your backside. No, no, uh, in housing. So I'm... Maybe property. Property, yeah. So me and the missus, we're saving now for a bit of land. Um, I used to work for a builder. I used to work for Builder Scaffolding. Funny enough, me and my wife have got a property company together. We've got HMOs and yeah, we're doing yeah, a yeah. project in Wigan at the moment, converting right. it into five flats. Ah, nice. Yeah. So, I, well, firstly, I want to I want to build me my own house, f- family home for me and the kids, obviously on the back of the boxing. Then I'm just going to do loads of rentals, flip, and I want to have incomes from, from all different places. Then I want to buy in Portugal. So I've got a house in Portugal, a house in uh, Newcastle. And I've just got property. I'll never be able to sit on my horse. Never, ever. I might even do some more courses and go like further afield, back offshore, like ROV pilots, do you know what I mean? Stuff like that on, on the oil rig. So like my cousin's got a huge rope access company. Do you know what I mean? I could be an NDT, non-destructive test out on the, on the legs. All that kind of stuff. I'll never, ever just sit in the house and no matter how much money I've got, no matter how much money I've got, I could have millions and I will never sit. I couldn't sit still because that's when I would fall back into the old me. I'll just yeah. have one drink. One drink turns to fucking ten, and before you know it, I'm back in that in that place. In that in that yeah, that bad groove. It would be almost wrong of me not to talk about Geordie Shaw. I didn't want to be that podcaster to talk to you just about yeah, Geordie yeah. Shaw because that's what you're known for. But everything we spoke about is what I'm really interested in. Yeah. But I just thought we'd touch on it. Um, I've never been into. I've never been on reality TV. I haven't really ever properly followed any of them. My missus has, has had them on, you know, like the Towers, the Made in Chelsea, yeah, yeah, a little yeah. bit of Geordie Shaw. There was another one. I, I had a guest on called Alfie Best Jr., who's also a boxer. Um, he was on Ascot, yes. the Ascot one. Um, pros and cons of it. You know, like, why did you get into it? How did you get into it? The ups and the downs of it. Just round it off if you could. Obviously, Pros is you're fucking, you're on TV, do you know what I mean? You're, you're making money. Um, the downside for me was drinking. My show, it revolved around drinking. Six nights out a week, one night off, six weeks. No phone, no no contact with the outside world. Do you know what I mean? Was it quite promoted as well in-house at Geordie Shore? Like, 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 it was I, almost I walked like... down the street, listen to this, I walked down the street in New Zealand, High Street, in a salon of women went fucking crazy, screaming. I ran from Jolly Shore, and I'm on the opposite side of the world. I went to Australia, fucking anywhere, like it was crazy. I walked out to a club in Italy. I thought he was like, walked up some steps, right? I hadn't even had a drink, right? It was, this is my fucking worst nightmare. So it was like, it looked like a beach bar. And I, it was, I had been booked to go to a club. It looked like a beach bar, right? I still laugh at this day, because I can only imagine my face. And there was like, there was some steps. It looked like a stage. Yeah. And he was like, we're just going to go through here. 
the kid was speaking broken English, so I'm just like, right, okay, then. <laughs> Any drinks? He's like, yeah, 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 we're just going to go through here. And I just heard three, two, one, and he just pushed us out. And there was about fucking 3,000 people. And they just turned the music off and gave us a mic, and I was just like, hello. <laughs> I didn't say anything. And I was just like, and I was sober. And I was like, <laughs> and I just, made I fucking froze. I froze. And I, everyone was just looking at me the phones, and I was just like, and then it was like, it's, the bloke started speaking in Italian and then they turned the music on. And I was like, fucking get me a drink. I was like, I need a drink. And I was, oh, honestly, it, it was, it's mental. Like going to different places around the world and people knowing who you are. That's the, that, like, it, it, it's nice. Mad. Nice in some ways. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah. I'll be honest with you, right? When I, when I speak to some people from social media, like from Jordy Show, a lot of people get hate. I've never really had any hate. Obviously online I have. I've never really had any hate to my face, ever, ever. But I feel like that's because of the per- I went on Jordy's show as me. I never started playing this fucking, this persona I've been. This, oh, yeah. Aaron, on, this is, that's Aaron on Jordy's show. This is the real Aaron. I was just me. And I feel like that's what got us so far in life because I've never been fake. I've never been, a, I've never been wanting to be fake or be a faker or that kind of person. So I feel like that's why I've always had a good, like I went to the boxing, Liam, um, Liam Williams, Chris Eubank Jr. at the weekend and 5,000 people in the stadium, Welsh, and I never, everyone, oh, Aaron, when are you fighting again? And I've all, I always get a good reception, more so off the lads, yeah, more off lads than I do women. Do you know what I mean? Because everyone wants to know about the fighting and, and all that kind of stuff. So, like I say, when it's good, it's good. Like I say, the downside of, of being on TV is the social media and, and the hate, but... Like I say, you have to take the rough with the smooth and it, it's it's just one of them things. But if I wasn't on Jordy Shaw, I certainly wouldn't be sitting here now. Because again, the same kind of mindset applies with social media to maybe TV. Again, I've never been on TV, but I can imagine it's virtually the same, which is use it, don't let you use you. And when I look at someone like Tommy Mallet, right? Yeah, smashed it. I take my hat off to the geezer. Yeah, he smashed because, it. Because like, he's taken his own profile He's, I don't think he's ever tried to put on persona. I've met him, I think, once or twice in Dubai for uh, mutual friends. And he's built this great brand and he's absolutely scaling it, rolling it out. And he just seems like he's loving life. He's yeah. got a good family, nice family. He's just someone that I admire and really respect. And yeah. you're doing the same sort of thing now with your, with your boxing. And no doubt, after the boxing, it could be other opportunities, yeah. property or other brands, etc. And I think yeah. that's kind of the way you need to use that profile. 100% exactly that because it's not going to last forever the TV will not last forever because on, on TV when I was on there I needed them more than they needed me and they knew that they knew that I needed them to keep, to keep the money coming in in the profile so they would they would use you like however they wanted we need you to, we need you to just just uh, can, can you just come here can you just do this and kind of use you as pawns in the game to make good TV Whereas now, they need me more than I need them. So when we film the Geordie OGs and stuff, I can be like, well, ah, these are the data and I'll say, right, I can't do this, this and this because I've got me boxing. Me boxing yeah. comes before anything. Well, yeah. my family comes before anything, then me boxing. So it kind of flipped the switch, but I, on the height of Geordie Shaw, I needed them more than they needed me. All of us needed them because we knew the TV show was that big. If we didn't do it, there's a fucking hundred and other people that would step in our place and do do it. So how did you get like sort of shortlisted a pick for it? So when the first series come out, the first they were, they were always around town, and I used to be a topless waiter in town. Right. I was in fucking really good shape, but I had a missus, and they come up. Oh, do you want to sign for this Jordy show? And I used to watch Jersey Show, and I was like, Nah, fuck that. Nah, I've got a missus, and it was a woman who I always kept in contact with us from then. So she asked us on episode. Two, I said nah. I went had an interview for episode series four, I think it was, and it went down to me, me and uh, Ricky, a lad called Ricky, went in. And then series eight, I was offshore, and I was just, I, and then I was just for fuck this. Can you come for an interview, Aaron? Please went there straight in with the producers, and they were like, why should we pick you? I said, find another lad in Newcastle with as many tattoos as me. Something like that can pull as many. Something cringy like that will pull as many birds as I can. And this lad was just—he couldn't. He was just looking at his, and he was just like, "That's he's the one that we want." And I, from then, I just—I I got it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But like I say, it's because 
like social media, like the TV now though, there's so many people that they can replace you with. That's why it's hard now. When when I was on there, there wasn't many reality TV shows. There's fucking there's a hundred. So there's probably a hundred more now than when I when I first went on there. Do you know what I mean? So the tent yeah. the tent to a penny. The works not the works drying up. It's it's a hard life. It's a fucking hard life if you haven't got your head switched on. Because it's easy to just go out. out like I say, I was blowing money left, right, and centre, buying supercars, buying fucking Rolex watches. And then I've had to sell all of them because, I, but I've got a house, I've got yeah. an asset, you know what I mean? Which is the fucking main thing. So it's easy to get sucked into this world of fucking living a life for other people. I was living the life for other people. Yeah, yeah. I had a what had a fucking forty grand Rolex. I had a Range Rover. I had an R8 at the same time, but I was living at my mother's. Mm. Fucking weird. Three hundred thousand pounds worth of stuff. That wasn't even well. The watch was mine, but the cars were on finance. Yeah, it's crazy. And I look back now and think, fuck me, I could have had fucking three houses now. I got into sales when I was like, like uh, you've got like, I always see you've always got nice watches on. Yeah, I, I do like I do like watches, and I think it just comes with the territory of like when 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 you're in We've business got a bit and, of money, and, of and, and when you're doing well. But again, yeah, I've got properties. Um, I've also got other, other other things I'm doing, and I think I think it's good to have those things as a medal of achieving a certain amount of success. Not even just that, though. You're always going to have money on your wrist. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's an, an investment. investment. Yeah, exactly it's right. An investment. You, you mentioned something earlier, which I wasn't actually going to bring bring up because I didn't know how to slide it in. But you just touched on it when you was going through Geordie Shaw about your tattoos. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got one tattoo myself on my back, yeah. so you know I've, I've been, been for it. And I saw a really funny tweet from you, which I really admired. Someone said, "Why has Aaron got a black arm?" And you tweet back to them because it's my fucking arm. I want to, yeah, or something, yeah. something yeah. really, really, funny? really, really simple. And I, I, I laughed as I as I read it because it, it's the truth. But with the tattoos, in, are you looking to do more? Because I mentioned, I saw something on your socials before where you're trying to remove some. Yeah, of Yeah, I've removed nearly all my front. Okay, I saw. I got a tribal. Remember tribal. I got a tribal when I've I was 16. One. I've right? got one on my back. So I remember yeah. I watched uh, Dust Till Dawn. Dust Till Dawn, the film, and he had tribal all up his arms at George Clooney. Yeah. He had tribal everywhere. 16, I was like, fuck it. I was like, I'm going to get a tattoo. My dad was like, go on then. Thinking I was was going to get, and I come back and me fucking, from there to there was a tribal. And he was like, you fucking stupid, come what you've done. And I was like, I don't, like, I was, I was only an outline. I was thinking, what the fuck have I done? I just jumped in. And so, it was in someone's kitchen. Some bloke was smoking. Fucking yeah, he was smoking a fan, he was tattooing me on, right? And I was in the back of the kitchen, I think I paid 30 quid for the oh outline, I paid 30 quid to colour it in. And then I, I and then I started getting loads of Japanese around it. And then I just didn't like them. I didn't like them, and then I started seeing loads of black work, and there was a bloke in Shrewsbury, and I was what looking at these black work, and I was like, I want to get black work, I want to get black work. Um so I got I got me on black by a woman, by some woman in Newcastle. Uh, and she had cut it off. She cut it, cut it off straight like a like a fucking like that t-shirt line. Yeah. So it looked like it just didn't look like, right. Like robotic. Like ro- like like the arm was stuck on. You yeah. know, like a fucking like an action man arm. Yeah. Was stuck on black. And I was like, I don't like this. So I went and seen this bloke, and he was drawing on this. And he was like, we need it all to be symmetrical, Aaron, across the chest, and that because I had black my neck. And I done the neck, and then I went. I, I, there's a bloke I had went a zap laser in Brighton. And I went and seen them. They're like, Aaron, we'll, we'll be able to get your neck off. So I was like, right, fuck it. So I've lasered nearly all my front off and I'm going to laser all my neck off. I'm going to retattoo the front and I'm going to leave the neck. And then that, that's me done. So then that's me fully covered. I've, I'm, I've literally got half a leg to finish. Redo my front and then this will come off. But I've only had one laser and it's it's broke up already. So they're about Is it painful ten... taking, taking it off? <sighs> Is it? A f- hundred times worse than a tattoo. Yeah. But it's a hundred times quicker. Is it? So like, just say like a dot, like a, like a fucking small, if, like yeah. a dot bone. So then every time they hit, it goes into a, a, a little white blister. So as quick as they can cover that area, so the hands, quick as they can cover that area and blisters, that's it done. Okay. So it's like four or five minutes, but yeah. it's four or five minutes of fucking, one, one of the, not not down there, I was at home and tattoos use like, you know, like like sticks, like lolly sticks okay. to, to use the, uh, the Vaseline. And I must, I nearly snapped through fucking for them. When he was doing my stomach, I was biting that hard, right? And I was just like, fuck this. But I'm determined. Like I yeah. say, once I get something in my head, I have to fucking go through with it. Yeah. So stupid, really. I should never have got the first tattoo with the fucking tribal when I was 16 and I wouldn't be sitting in this position. But yeah, at the minute, everything's half done. Half Arms half lasered off. Chest is, I need a few more on the chest. Legs half done. So it's, it lo- when it's all done, everyone's thinking, ah, it looks good. But 
it, it takes a long time. Well, like any consolation, you actually do suit your tattoos. Uh, I think I think it's a dark hair, slightly tan <laughs> beard, you, and and you're a fighter. I think if you weren't a fighter, it would almost be like I don't know, or a rock star. You got to be a rock star. I had the long hair as a rock star. <laughs> it's the neck that you know is. I've done the neck because I had like Japanese on my neck, and I, there was what it was a woman I didn't like, and I, I wish I knew then I could go and get it lasered. Um, but I didn't so I blacked it and I fucking so instead of just getting the laser and getting it off I fucking blacked it to then get it off so I've done it I do everything backwards put it that way <laughs> I, I do everything backwards instead of just going to get lasered I tattooed it worse to then get it lasered so it's probably going to take an extra five sittings um, look Aaron I, I know you've probably got to get back to training I really appreciate your time I'm going to ask you one more question the same question I ask all my guests go I for ask, it I ask Mick this question Harlem etc go for it when I started my own business, I came up with a mantra, something I live by day to day. I try to anyway. In my own gym out indoors, I've got a hashtag of it, which is be happy, never content. I've got my own reason, my interpretation of what that means to me. I'm going to ask you, Aaron, what does be happy, never content mean to you? Obviously, be happy is be happy as in yourself, like a happy person, because if you're not happy, then that leads to depression, anxiety. Being content, don't never be content, was it? Be happy, never content. <sighs> like, never be content with what you've got because it could all be taken away tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? Like, I always strive. I always strive for better in myself, in everything I do. So, I'm never, I'll never ever be content in my life, ever. I always want, if I've got a five bedroom house, I think, fry fuck it. The next, I need a six bedroom. I, I always have to strive for that more, and I feel like that's that's what God is so far in life now. So that's what it means to me. So never be content and always strive for more. Good man, Aaron. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thanks thank for thank you. Thank you. Time. I do apologise. It took so long. No, no problem, man. I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm really just thankful, humble that you said yes and, and and came on. It's been a great conversation. On that note, if you've enjoyed the conversation. Please follow Aaron, uh, follow his journey, his boxing journey, uh, subscribe, like, and be happy, never content. Thank you very much. Good man, thank you very much, Michael. Cool.